All right, everybody, welcome back. I'm excited for this one. We're going deep today into a topic that's both fascinating and a little bit unnerving. Oh, yeah. It's definitely one of those topics that makes you kind of look around and wonder what the future holds. Exactly. We're talking about the increasingly blurry line between machines and living things. Right, where science fiction starts to bump into reality. Exactly. So to get us started, we're diving into an article from Nature Machine Intelligence called Discussions of Machine versus Living Intelligence Need More Clarity by Nicholas Rouleau and Michael Levin. Catchy title, right? Well, it definitely grabs your attention. Mm. But what's really interesting is that Rouleau and Levin are challenging some fundamental assumptions about intelligence and consciousness. Yeah, they're basically saying, forget this idea that intelligence is just an on-off switch. It's not that simple. Like either you're intelligent or you're not. Right. They're proposing that we think of intelligence as more of a spectrum or a continuum, you know, with different levels and types of intelligence. Mm -hmm. A continuum of intelligence. <laughs> okay. I like that. So on one end of the spectrum, you might have, say... Bacteria. Yeah, simple organisms. And then further along, you might have, I don't know, dogs? Primates. Primates, sure. And then us humans somewhere. Who are in the mix. And then, I guess, theoretically, super advanced AI on the far end. Potentially, yeah, if it ever gets to that point. Right. So the idea is that instead of these hard categories of machine versus living being, we need to consider the possibility that intelligence might exist in many different forms. And maybe even in unexpected places. Exactly. And that's where things start to get really mind-bending. Okay, so let's talk about some of those mind-bending examples. Yeah. You know, where do we start seeing this blur between machine and living intelligence in the real world? I mean, aside from these hypothetical super-intelligent AIs. Well, think about the advancements in fields like bioengineering and cybernetics. I mean, we're already seeing things like prosthetic limbs that are controlled by the user's thoughts. Oh, wow. So, like, brain-computer interfaces? Yeah, exactly. And then there are these biohybrid robots. They're being developed with living tissues integrated into their systems. Okay. So you've got machines with living components. And on the flip side, you've got organisms being enhanced with technology. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, where does that lead? I mean, are we talking about cyborgs walking around in the future? It's not out of the realm of possibility. Right. And then how do you even define what a living being is at that point. I mean, that's a whole other philosophical can of worms. Well, that's exactly what Rouleau and Levin are getting at in this article. It's not just about the technology itself. It's about how these advancements force us to rethink some of our most basic assumptions about intelligence and life. Okay, so let's dig into some of those assumptions because I know our listeners are probably thinking, wait a minute, are you telling me that my Roomba might be intelligent? Well, your Roomba might not be writing poetry anytime soon. <laughs> But the point is that we often underestimate the intelligence of even simple organisms. Give me an example. Slime molds. Slime molds. Yeah. They don't have brains. They're single-celled organisms. But they can solve mazes. They can find the most efficient path to a food source. There's even some evidence that they can learn and remember. Whoa. Okay. So intelligence without a brain. I mean, that challenges a lot of our preconceived notions about what intelligence even means. And there are even more extreme examples. The authors talk about research on molecular networks and how some of these networks exhibit problem-solving behavior. Hold on. Intelligent molecules. I need a minute to process this. So we're talking about intelligence at a level we can barely even comprehend. It really stretches our understanding. And it goes beyond the physical world, too. What about problem solving in abstract spaces like mathematical models or computer simulations? Okay, yeah, that gets really complex. I mean, when we start considering things like that as potentially intelligent, where does it end? I mean, does a computer program that can beat a chess grandmaster count as intelligent? That's where things get really tricky. And that's why Rouleau and Levin are advocating for a more nuanced approach. They're not saying that every complex system is necessarily intelligent. But they are saying that we need to be careful about drawing hard lines. Okay, so how do we even begin to navigate this uncharted territory? I mean, how do we decide what counts as intelligence when we're talking about everything from bacteria to supercomputers? Well, that's where the flowchart comes in. The flowchart? Yeah, they include a flowchart in the article. It's designed to guide us through this process of evaluating intelligence. Basically, it's a series of questions to ask ourselves, like, can this system process information? Can it adapt to its environment? Can it learn and solve problems? So it's a tool to help us think more critically about these issues and to challenge our own assumptions about what intelligence might look like. 
Exactly. And I think one of the most important takeaways from this article is that we need to approach this topic with a lot of humility. Humility. Okay. Why is that so important? Because we're still in the very early stages of understanding consciousness and intelligence. We don't have all the answers. And we might never have all the answers. Right. So clinging to these rigid definitions and categories might actually be holding us back. Exactly. We need to be open to the possibility that intelligence might exist in ways that we haven't even imagined yet. Okay, so let's zoom out for a second. I mean, we've covered a lot of ground here. Can we recap some of the key points from the article? Sure. So first off, the line between machines and living beings is getting increasingly blurry. Secondly, intelligence might exist on a continuum, not as a simple on-off switch. Third, unconventional examples of intelligence like slime molds and molecular networks are challenging our traditional assumptions. Okay, keep going. Fourth, embodiment might not be as essential for cognition as we previously thought. Fifth, we need to question our assumptions about sentience and consciousness. Sixth, we need to be cautious about jumping to conclusions in this field because we're still learning so much. And what was the seventh point? Ah, yes. Seventh, we need flexible theories of intelligence that can adapt to new discoveries and advancements because things are changing rapidly. All right, so to wrap things up, let's bring it back to the listener. I mean, this is all very fascinating, but why should they care about this whole machine life intelligence continuum? Well, think about the implications for the future. How will we interact with increasingly intelligent machines? How will our understanding of consciousness shape the development of new technologies? And how will these advancements impact our understanding of ourselves and our place in the universe? Big questions for sure. And I don't think anyone has all the answers. But one thing's for certain. This is a conversation that's only going to get more complex and more important as we move forward. So if you're intrigued by the ideas we've discussed today, I highly encourage you to check out the full article by Rouleau and Levin. It's called Discussions of Machine versus Living Intelligence Need More Clarity. And it's published in Nature Machine Intelligence. You can find the link in the show notes. It's a deep dive for sure, but it's well worth the effort. And with that, we'll wrap up this deep dive. Thanks for joining us. Until next time.